Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with an enriching top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell so that you don't miss out on any of our new videos. Today's topic, 10 keys to consider when we think about worship. Worship is one of the most important, but one of the most misunderstood ideas in the church today because it has come to mean almost any church activity. Its true meaning has been almost lost, and the Lord's Supper is perhaps the most neglected meeting of the church. It's high time to rediscover and recommit to the holy art of worship. So let's think about this. Number one, we need to understand what worship really is. Sounds like a good place to start. <laughs> Define your terms. You know, the 1828 edition of the Webster Dictionary has some excellent definitions of Bible words. And in this case, it says, worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. The word most often used in the New Testament for worship is the word proskuneo, that is, to kiss towards. And when we think about the adoration of his person, the appreciation of his work, we see the first mention of worship, worshiping Christ in the New Testament, was these Gentile wise men who said, we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him, which is a little hint that by and large the nation of Israel were not seeking for him, and here were these Gentiles from afar who did come. The second reference to worshiping the Lord is the exact opposite, is the king of the Jews saying, you go and search diligently for the young child, and when you find out where he is, you come back and tell us so that we may come and worship him also. But they were going to do exactly the opposite. And then the third one is Satan where he says, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. That's in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 9. So what do we see here? This is a battle for God to get his rightful due. The devil does not want God to be worshipped. And so he's done several things. He has distressed people. He has caused them to be so grieved in their own personal lives that they become distracted from God. They don't think about God. And then secondly, he has distracted the church from worshiping God by all sorts of entertainment and alternatives, substitutes for the true worship of God. And so we need to get back to the biblical idea if we're going to be true worshipers in spirit and in truth. Number two, worship should be a lifestyle. You probably heard the phrase that instead of thanksgiving day, it should be thanks living all the time. And the same is true with worship. Worship is intimacy, and intimacy requires personal knowledge and honesty. And it requires quality time with the other person. And so we shouldn't think of worship as something simply we come and do now and again. It's an attitude of the heart that eventually expresses itself in various ways through our mouth, but it starts in the heart. And it's not something we should turn on and off. It's an ongoing appreciation of God. Number three, we should understand how worship and remembrance relate. So the Lord Jesus asked us to remember him and declare his death until he comes. And this puts the focus of remembrance as being quite distinctive. Worship is much broader. I can worship God for getting me a job or for healing me of some disease. There are lots of reasons to worship God, endless reasons. But when we think about remembrance this time at the Lord's Supper, it's a little more focused. And we don't want to make a man a liar for a word. If he did worship God for something that may not be focused on the person of Christ and the cross of Christ, but that's the main objective and these two emblems that are there on the table remind us the separation of the body and the blood 
pictured in the distinct bread and wine. So remembrance is a subset, if you will, of the much wider field of worship. And worship is the response of the heart to the goodness of God and the goodness of his deeds. Then, number four, we should distinguish the Lord's table from the Lord's Supper. Again, we don't want to separate them in the sense that one is not involved with the other. In 1 Corinthians 10, we have the Lord's table. Now, the Lord's table is an Old Testament as well as a New Testament idea. Can the Lord spread a table in the wilderness? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So the concept of the Lord's table is there in the Old as well as the New. The Lord's Supper is uniquely New Testament. So as far as the Lord's table is concerned, the idea is that I sit at his table and he feeds me. He feeds me with thoughts of Christ. He gives me the delicious food, the, the king's dainties all week long. And as I meditate on the Lord and his goodness, I'm preparing for the Lord's Supper. At the Lord's Supper I come and I simply give him back what he's been given me. As David said, we give thee but thine own. Every sacrifice ever offered on Jewish altars, it was God who provided the lambs. They couldn't make lambs. And so God was the one who provided it. So as we sit at the Lord's table, he feeds us through the week. And then we come to the supper, which is the climax of the table. And now we have the privilege of giving back to him those things that he's been giving us. And that's where Paul says, you have a choice this week to sit at the table of the Lord or sit at the table of demons. In other words, to be pro-God or anti-God. And if you're sitting at the table of the Lord, he's feeding you. But if you're sitting at the table of demons, we know there are lots of things on the internet and television, even in our own minds, there are lots of things out there will feed the wrong part of us. And if we do that all week long, we have nothing to bring to the Lord's Supper. But as he feeds us during the week, then we can come and give back to him. In other words, to enjoy with him the beauties and wonders of his son. I don't have much in common with God. He's infinite, I'm finite, he's perfect, I'm a sinner. But one thing we do have in common is our love for Jesus. And that's the focus of the Lord's Supper. Number five, worship involves offerings on the altar of our heart. Some people have the idea that all the sacrifices were in the Old Testament and there are no sacrifices in the New. But the New Testament tells us that we're priests to God too and we're welcome in the sanctuary and unlike uh, the priests of the Old Testament, the, only the high priest could go in there. But we're welcome in the holiest by the blood of Jesus. But there are in the New Testament a whole series of sacrifices, offerings that we are called upon to make. And so we read, for example, in Romans chapter 1 through 11, the focus is on the sacrifice of Christ. But in chapter 12, verse 1, the focus shifts and we are called upon, it is our reasonable worship, to sacrifice our bodies to the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2, it's our daily lives. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So we're to walk in love every day as an act of sacrifice to the Lord. And then we read, Paul says, I'm full, having received from Epaphroditus, the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Here were the sacrificial gifts of God's people for the advancement of the cause of Christ in the world. In Hebrews 13, 15, we read about the sacrifice of praise to God. Easy enough to praise the Lord when things are going well, but it's a real sacrifice of praise to praise the Lord anyway when things are going well tough on us to still go on praising the Lord anyway. Number six, worship is fed by meditation when the word of Christ dwells in us richly. Jesus said the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And so the truth 
is like the sweet incense beaten small that was put on the censer. And so our hearts are the censer and the sweet incense causes this aroma of worship to go up to God. And that's exactly what the two on the Emmaus Road said. Didn't our heart burn within us while he talked to us along the way and as he opened to us the scriptures? So the Lord was taking the incense of God's word and putting it on the censers of their heart and the worship was rising up to God. So I think it's important that as we think about the truth of God in the word of God, that we worship not only in spirit, but in truth. Paul said, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit and I will also sing with the understanding. So God provided the fire in the Old Testament. The fire came out from the presence of God and it ignited the altar. And so we should not be stimulating with artificial emotional means our sacrifices to the Lord. We should allow the Spirit of God to inflame us as we meditate on the Word of God. Number seven, worship is stirred by psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Yes, in Ephesians chapter 5, we read that it's the outflow of being filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So the songs of worship first speak to ourselves and then result in praise to God. In other words, we're calling on our spirits to rise up and to praise the Lord. And we can use the hymns and spiritual songs of other people because heart answers to heart as face to face in water. So as I read of the spiritual experiences of others, my heart catches hold. It begins to throb in sympathy with the worship of the church and God is glorified by this. Number eight, we worship God, Father, Son, and Spirit, but there are patterns given in Scripture. The standard pattern that we see in Scripture is that all worship goes to the Father because as we saw recently, He is the giver of every good gift. He gave the Son. He gave the Spirit. And so worship naturally flows to God the Father who is the source of all. But it can only rise to the Father through the Son because He is the way to the Father. And it only is done correctly in spirit and truth when the Holy Spirit himself, who is the spirit of truth, is motivating us and directing us, taking of the things of Christ, showing them to us, and stirring our hearts in love and devotion to him. So that is the pattern that our worship is to the Father in the name of the Son, by his authority, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But it's not wrong to worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have a beautiful inspired example of that in the first chapter of Ephesians. There's praise to the Father, then praise to the Son, then praise to the Holy Spirit for all that these three members of the Trinity have done for us. Number nine, worship should be both intimate and reverend. And this is a careful balance, isn't it? He's my Father but he's my God, right? I ascend to my Father, your Father, my God, your God. He is the infinite God. He is other. He's nothing like me. He is perfection itself. He is all-knowing. Because God is in heaven and we are on earth, let our words be few. We wouldn't magnify our words in his presence. We're not showing off when we're worshiping. We're not trying to come up with some new thought that God never thought of regarding his son. We're simply agreeing with God at what he already knows. And so as we worship God, we understand that this worship is intimate. We draw near to him. He loves us, but also recognizing what reverence is. Holy fear is not slavish, but it's it's a due reverence to God for who he is. Then finally, number 10, worship should overflow in service, the two occupations in eternity. Yes, 
the two words, latreia, worship, and douleia, service, are used almost interchangeably when applied to serving the Lord, ministering to the heart of God and ministering to the house of God. In Romans 12.1, the verse we've already referred to, sometimes it's translated reasonable service, other places intelligent worship, because really the two ideas, when it comes to serving the Lord, it is an act of worship. So when we think about that, it's impossible to come and express the worth-ship of the Lord and not think that he's worth my Monday morning and my Thursday afternoon and my Saturdays. He's only worth a few empty words on Sunday. That shouldn't be the case. So as I come and learn the value and express my devotedness to him, obviously that should overflow in service. We don't work up a worshipful spirit by serving him. Rather, we come first. It's the primacy of worship. And as we worship him, our hearts overflow in gratitude and we say, Lord, what can I do for you? So these two questions of Paul, who are you, Lord, and what will you have me to do, are the two interlocked ideas that as I discover more and more of who he is, I long more and more to do what he wants me to do.